We talk a lot on this channel about film history and theory. When we review a movie, I try to relate back to other films or genres to discuss what makes good cinema, and I do that to entertain you and hopefully help you decide whether you want to spend your time and money seeing a particular movie in the theater. But we also take this approach because the story of film is being perpetually written. And as the medium changes and new artists emerge, it's important to know the giants atop whose shoulders those artists now stand. Of course, there are far too many films and indeed too many directors for anybody to know them all. And sometimes an important name slips through the cracks. This brings us to Larissa Shapitka. If you haven't heard of her, you aren't alone. But believe me when I say that the story of Ms. Shapitka is one you need to know. And even if you're unfamiliar with her work, you should at least become familiar with her life. Larissa Shapitka risked and later gave her life to film. She created masterpieces while combating illness, injury, and unimaginable conditions. She challenged the Soviet film industry and helped define it at a time where the USSR gave us some of film's greatest legends. And film goers and art lovers alike should know that. Outside of Eastern Europe, her legacy is largely untold. Today we hope to change that. Larisa Shapitka was born in Soviet Ukraine in 1938 to her mother, a school teacher, and father, a Persian military officer who absconded around the time of the Second World War. At 16, she moved to Moscow to enroll at the Gerasimov Institute of Cinematography, or as it was known, the VGIK. Tarkovsky, Mikhailkov, Sokarov, it's hard to name a filmmaker of her generation who did not come up through the Institute, though all too often her name is neglected. Shapitka studied under Alexander Dovzhenko, who pioneered what came to be known as Soviet montage theory, or the idea that you can learn just as much from a series of images in sequence as you can through exposition. And it may sound simple now, but remember that at one time an audience didn't realize that the bullets being fired toward the screen in the great train robbery were fake. Minds like Dovzhenko's defined early film theory and later shaped the minds of artists like Larisa Shapitka. In 1963, Shapitka directed her first feature film, Zhnoi, or Heat. The production of this film was an arduous one. During production, she contracted hepatitis A and often had to direct portions of the film from a stretcher. In addition, temperatures ranged up to 50 degrees Celsius, or approximately 122 degrees Fahrenheit. That's so hot that the film literally began to melt during shooting. The struggle to complete the film proved worthwhile, however, as Genoi earned her praise, various awards, graduation rights from the VGIK, and introduced her to a fellow student director named Ilem Klimov, who would later become her husband. To understand the career of Larisa Shapitka, you have to understand the world of Soviet filmmaking that she was entering in 1963. Not unlike state-run media industries in China or Iran, filmmakers in the USSR worked under tremendous censorship and constraints, like Nazi Germany, which notably used Triumph of the Will as a propaganda piece, Russia understood the power of cinema as an influencer since as far back as 1922, when Vladimir Lenin issued his directives on the film business, which required all films to be registered and approved by the state if they were to be shown at all. And many may think of the Red Scare in the United States when they think of political scrutiny in the film industry. And those that don't believe America once blacklisted celebrities for challenging political thought would be well served to ask Lester Cole and the Hollywood Ten. Sadly, the threats facing filmmakers in the USSR put other censorship bodies to shame. First known as the Goskino, the state body overseeing censorship of film in Soviet Russia would later be known as the Ministry of Cinema. There, Joseph Stalin was often involved directly in reviewing films and demanding revisions. Niet, niet, you are not listening to me. You make Bran the king and then everybody will be happy. Trust me on this and get rid of that fucking Starbucks cup. He was known to retitle films, to alter dialogue or visuals, and while his edits were often arbitrary and seemingly at random, filmmakers knew that failure to appease their leader and gain approval from the state would, at best, prevent their film from seeing the light of day. At worst, films that failed to idealize socialist realism, to depict socialism as universally good and capitalism as universally bad, led to filmmakers like Margarita Barskaya being arrested and left to die in a gulag. While the very real fear in the United States was to be blacklisted from Hollywood, Filmmakers in the USSR could be sentenced to death for their art. Upon Stalin's death in 1953, just one year before Larisa Shapitka would enroll at the VGIK, Nikita Khrushchev took over as secretary of the Communist Party and thus began what came to be known as the Khrushchev Thaw. Whereas Stalin micromanaged the film industry, treating it as an arm of the state, Khrushchev loosened the reins. He allowed filmmakers to introduce new and challenging themes to the medium. As strange as it may seem, Khrushchev a man best known for neither blowing up the United States in 1963 nor being Boris Yeltsin, oversaw a remarkable period of de-censorship in the USSR, without which the works of Larisa Shapitka, Andrei Tarkovsky, and other legendary Russian directors may never have been released. 
Imagine now being a young filmmaker whose passion for the art had all your life come with state-imposed limitations on what you can say or do. Limitations that, if broken, could end your life. Imagine being a filmmaker trapped behind the Iron Curtain, only hearing of Lawrence Olivier, Kurosawa, Orson Welles. Imagine not being able to see the films celebrated outside your borders and knowing that the state offered the pursuit of your dreams before you like a cake beneath the guillotine. Now imagine that all those restraints, all those threats and limitations vanished overnight. It was open season and it was the world facing Larissa Shapitka. In a twist of dramatic irony, Shapitka's first triumph in many ways embodies the invisibility of her legacy. Released in 1966, Shapitka's post-war drama, Wings, is a film about a female fighter pilot and war hero relegated to playing the relic of a forgotten era. Displaced between the generation of heroes that died before her and a new generation enveloped in the social change of post-Stalinist Soviet Russia. The star of the film, Maya Blagokova, plays a school teacher named Nadezhda, whose decorated career as a fighter pilot is worn around her neck like an albatross. She's seen as a dinosaur by the youth, defined by the scars of her past, who lived an honorable life except for the fact that she is still alive. Her disposition and heartache keeps her ostracized from her contemporaries and family alike, and she drifts alone with nobody to relate. Shapitka's protagonist is looking for meaning, with a youthful desire to find purpose and belonging, as she has become cursed by the entire life in her rearview mirror. This new USSR has no place for war heroes like Nadezhda. Her past hangs in a museum with the names of her dead comrades and lover, and her existence asks the question, where do you put a fighter plane in peacetime if not to rot in the hangar? And for the sake of brevity, the defense will stipulate that Shapitka was a talented filmmaker, but it was her filmmaking philosophy and dedication to the craft that makes her story so important. In 1977, Shapitka saw the release of what many consider to be her opus, a black and white war film called The Ascent. It goes without saying that the film is a masterpiece. Following two Soviet soldiers separated from their unit in World War II, it rides in tandem for their attempts to find food, shelter, and survival in the unforgiving tundra of German-occupied Belarus. The film is a statement about war, but it's more importantly a statement about the human desperation not to live but simply not to die. This was a feeling Larissa Shapitka had come to know all too well. Years earlier, Shapitka had the disastrous experience of making You and I, a film that despite the best efforts of Soviet censors who tweaked its content, gained international acclaim. Many onset difficulties led to her being hospitalized for exhaustion, and the interference of the state led to a bitter post-production struggle to protect the ideas she wanted to present. By her admission, the struggle was largely a failure. Chapitka had been driven to such a state of exhaustion by the production of You and I that she voluntarily entered a sanatorium. There, she suffered a terrible fall that left her with numerous injuries to her head and spine. Shortly after recovering from that, she became an expecting mother and later birthed her only son with Elam Klimov, Anton, in a troubled pregnancy that again threatened her life. It is easy to understand why Chapitka would then direct the ascent as if it would be her last film. Life, in her mind, could now be given and taken in the blink of an eye. Regarding what films she now sought to direct, she stated she only chose those where, if she does not do it, then she dies. The production for The Ascent put that idea to the test. Her approach to the film placed its underlying philosophies ahead of any other traditional element of filmmaking. She cast unknown actors whose presence and backgrounds embodied the characters she wanted them to portray. When it came to locations, she maintained that adherence to authenticity. Filming began on location in the fields of Murom, in snowy weather reaching 40 degrees below zero. She made it impossible for the actors to feel any way other than how their characters would. Frozen, stranded, and with a mission to accomplish. We speak all too often of method actors, but with the ascent, Shapitka may have become one of the first method directors. She refused any special treatment on set. She wore only clothing equal to that of her actors, inviting the same risks of frostbite and hypothermia, and suffered with them. For this leadership, actor Vladimir Gosyukin was quoted as saying it was worth it to die in the scene to be able to feel her gratitude. And if anybody would know what Shapitka went through on the set of The Ascent, it would be Gosyukin, who often had to carry the director to her hotel room after long and brutal days on set. Despite constant pain, illness, and unimaginable conditions, Shapitka demanded as much of herself as she did from her cast and crew. In one instance where she required her actors to be flush with fatigue, she sprinted alongside them out of frame to subject herself to their suffering. After all, it was this human suffering she sought to bring to the screen. Though the Khrushchev thaw had certainly taken away the threat of death for many filmmakers, it soon proved that the Soviet censorship state was alive and well. Due to controversy over the symbolism and content, the ascent was soon at risk of being yet another Shapitka project doomed to the affectations of the state. 
In desperation, Larissa's husband, Elam Klimov, requested an audience with the Communist Party of Belarus's secretary, Pyotr Masharov, for whom he screened the film in search of the secretary's formal blessing. Masharov allegedly claimed that he expected effeminate directorial work and was later quoted as saying that he questioned Shapitka's qualifications to direct a film about war as she experienced nothing of the sort. Perhaps unknown to Klimov was that Masharov's mother had been killed during the war, and perhaps unknown to Masharov, events depicted in the ascent by this effeminate director would prove to be all too real. An emotional Masharov became one of the first to celebrate the film, tearfully watching it in its entirety before granting it his approval. By the end of the year, it would win the prestigious Golden Bear at the Berlin International Film Festival. Against all odds, Shapitka's odyssey of life and death lived to see the light of day. Two years later, in 1979, Shapitka and several of her crew members were killed in a car accident while scouting locations for what would have been her follow-up to the ascent. She was 41 years old. Her final work, Farewell, would be finished by her husband, who would also direct a film in her honor titled simply Larissa. The director's sudden death struck the Russian film community to its core. Tarkovsky wrote, Larissa Shapitka was buried and so were five members of her team. A car accident. All killed instantly. It was so sudden that no adrenaline was found in their blood. After surviving illness and physical injury, the director's sudden death was perhaps a realization of the very fear that drove her to undertake the ascent in the first place. That life is fleeting and death the persistent enemy that gives it meaning. In the years following her death, Shapitka's movies slowly trickled out from behind the Iron Curtain. The films I've highlighted today, Wings and The Ascent, are both available on the new Criterion channel and in their Eclipse collection of her filmography. Nevertheless, and despite the increase in her film's availability, the legacy of Larissa Shapitka appears to have been forgotten. A Google search of great Russian directors brings an immediate list of 50 names, including her husband's, and yet none of those names are hers. And the books we've brought in while researching this project, including young Soviet filmmakers, women directors, the emergence of a new cinema, and others, speak of her for approximately one collective page. For a director that persevered through so much, from health issues to the lingering affectations of the censorship state of the USSR, and for a woman whose films constantly pushed the boundaries of what was acceptable in her time, we think she deserves better. An icon in film and a visionary director whose demands of her cast and crew were only outdone by the demands she placed upon herself, we hope to have done a small part in spreading her story and keeping that legacy alive. Well, boy, that was a lot of me talking. And after editing most of this, I really hate my voice and my face. I was really sweaty during some of those shots. We need to get a new air conditioner that doesn't make noise, and I can leave it on. Hey, if you're new here and you enjoyed this, like, comment, subscribe, tell us what you liked, what you didn't like. And for those of you who are not new, well, do the same stuff, but don't subscribe because you're already subscribed. And if you click it again, you're just not going to be a subscriber anymore. And, uh, yeah, now we're just going to list our resources and the references we used to make this video. We really hope we did the subject justice. It's something that we really care about. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Mercifully, I'm going to stop talking now. My throat really hurts. And, uh, yeah, live your best life. Bye.